Today in this video, I'm going to show you how the Federal Reserve is actually the source and the cause behind today's widespread riots and violence by showing you four things. Number one, violence is caused by relative poverty. Number two, relative poverty is caused by inflation. Number three, the Federal Reserve controls and causes inflation. And number four, therefore, the Federal Reserve is responsible for what is going on today in our country. You ready? Let's dive in. This is Heresy Financial and my name is Joseph Brown and on this channel you will receive insights and information presented to you in a way that you are not going to find discussed on mainstream media, mainstream economic or financial news sources. Three things to note before we jump in. Number one, I am in no way endorsing the violence that is going on or giving any of this violence any sort of an excuse because I firmly believe that taking the correct actions any individual, regardless of their circumstances, you can get to where you want to go. A victim mentality never helps, only hurts. Whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. And so that is the reason behind this channel. I'm trying to provide tools that anybody, regardless of your background or situation, can employ and use in order to get ahead. That being said, this is a general observation about the way that nature and reality works. And looking at thousands of years of history, you can see patterns that societies go through. And you can make very strong arguments for, hey, if a happens, B or C is likely to happen next. It also gives people tools to start encouraging the right actions in order to encourage the likelihood of other outcomes happening. And everything that I'm going through in this video, I've got robust research sources linked in the description below of this video if you'd like to take a deeper dive into anything that I've said. All right, so point number one is that violence is caused by relative poverty. So number one, we need to define relative poverty. Relative poverty is is not absolute poverty. Relative poverty and poverty are different things. Relative poverty is what most people would normally just call inequality or local inequality versus just total poverty. There's an index called the Gini coefficient and this is a measurement of income or wealth distribution across societies and it, you can apply this coefficient to uh, cities, towns, states, or countries, and you can take a look and see what is the distribution of income or wealth. Is it a really steep distribution? Is there, you know, is it uh, a, a, most of the wealth held by just a small, small percentage? And it's a really steep ladder, basically, where most of the other people have virtually nothing in comparison. Or is the dis distribution of wealth really flat, and the people who are richest are not that much richer than everybody else? This is called the Gini coefficient. And what is absolutely 100% clear when you look at all of the available studies and research and evidence, the Gini coefficient lines up almost perfectly with violent crime. This is really important to understand because this means that violent crime is not caused by poverty, it's caused by relative poverty. So places whether it's cities, counties, states, countries, places that have high amounts of relative poverty, very poor people who are in close proximity to very rich people have very high levels of violent crime. The United States has a much steeper wealth distribution than Canada. We also have much higher rates of violent crime than Canada. But the United States is much more flat in its wealth distribution compared to somewhere like Mexico, and Mexico has a lot higher rates of violent crime than United States. This holds up across all demographics. You can look at small towns and cities all the way up to countries and it works across the board. Now there are some theories out there as to why this happens. Maybe you know the young men who are statistically going to be the most violent in any society. They look at the social ladder and realize there's really no way that I can see to help myself to take steps up the ladder to move myself ahead in society. So the next best option is to seek status instead of you know wealth and creation and actual productivity, which is going to be most easily achieved through violent actions. Okay, so now that I've demonstrated my case for violence being caused by relative poverty, 
we now have to take it to the next step, which is what causes relative poverty? What causes inequality in the first place? Well, it's inflation. And here's about a dozen charts and graphs that we're gonna look at here to prove that inflation causes relative poverty and inequality. And the best way to show this is to look at time frames of different data sets that start before we entered the period of the biggest inflation of history, 1971, when the entire world was set free from any linkage to something like a gold standard. This first chart that we're looking at here is the growth rate of productivity versus compensation. And we can see compensation and productivity were very, very closely tied until we left the gold standard. And once the government had the ability to print as much money as they wanted and not have any sort of tie to anything that gave them any limitations on how much money they could create, how much inflation they could cause, we started to see productivity kept on chugging along. We kept on having the same productivity, but average compensation went down. What this means is that the wealth that was created by that additional productivity that kept on happening went to a smaller and smaller percentage of people. This next chart that we're looking at here shows income gains and how these income gains were distributed throughout the different percentiles of Americans. And you can see that ever since we left the gold standard in 1971, these income gains have been disproportionately shared by a few at the top versus the majority, and it was not like this before. Again, more evidence on the fire that as soon as the government has the ability to create as much money as they want, what they're actually doing is siphoning purchasing power from the entire pie, and that purchasing power goes into the select few hands that the government has chosen. Next chart, median male income. Now this is particularly important when considering violence because violence is by and large committed by men. Almost all violent crimes are committed by men. That's just a fact. And so when you're making a case that says violence is caused by relative poverty and relative poverty is caused by inflation, well, it puts more fuel on the fire to see that inflation, when inflation takes off, men are more adversely affected by the income inequality. It's a double whammy here. And it has actually affected men more when you look at the data on how, how women's income has kept up. And so not only, not not only are people on average experiencing more inequality and more of the pie is going to a small amount of people due to inflation, but it's adversely and disproportionately affecting males who are by and large the more violent people by nature in a society. This graph here shows the top 1% versus the bottom 90%. And you can see that the trends clearly changed right when we went off the gold standard. Again, inflation is siphoning purchasing power via the printing of money to finance government spending. And so as that purchasing power gets slowly siphoned, invisibly siphoned away from the entire pie of purchasing power, it's directed into a few hands. And just for some more, let's look at these two additional graphs here that show how income inequality has changed and risen since we left the gold standard in 1971. Again, due to the fact that the government has been able to direct wealth and purchasing power at its discretion into the hands of the select few that it chooses. And that comes at the direct cost of everybody else. Still don't believe me? Let's look at a longer term trend. Let's go back to 1900 and we can see since the, the early 1900s, the wealth inequality was getting better and better and better and better until, oh, all of a sudden something changed. Hmm, when did it change? 1971. And then all of a sudden, as the government has the ability to spend without limit and siphon purchasing power from the total pie of wealth and goes into the hands of the few, hmm, I wonder what happens. Looks like that wealth gets transferred into the hands of a few and wealth inequality continues to move in the wrong direction. Now, just in case you're thinking, okay, that's fine, but anybody can choose to be part of that 1% part of that top percent by buying assets. Yes, that is true, but it has gotten vastly harder to invest today than it's been in most of American history. Take a look at this chart, which is 
going back to 1860. And this measures the amount of working hours that it takes to purchase the S&P 500. Now, I understand the actual S&P 500 wasn't available for total purchase up until the last few decades. There were no ETFs or S&P 500 mutual funds available all the way back through 1860, but this still represents the total cost that would cost somebody in terms of how much labor on average they would have to put in, how much earning they would have to participate in before they could invest in a backdated S&P 500. Goes back to 1860 and you can see the red line shows when 1871 happened. And you can see that very quickly following the leaving of the gold standard, the income inequality and wealth inequality started to catch up and it got more and more and more expensive to purchase assets assets as the inflation bid up the price of assets compared to the purchasing power of the average American. And now for the doozy, let's look at this chart that shows incarceration rates. Well, would you look at that? When did the turn happen? Oh, that's right. 1971. As soon as inflation started to take off, as soon as the government had unlimited power to start directing purchasing power and directing wealth into the hands that they saw fit, as soon as they had unlimited spending power, as soon as they had unlimited spending power to spend on things that are massively expensive, such as incarceration, you started to see incarceration rates astronomically spike. And it is vitally important that it disproportionately affects men because men by by and large are going to be the more violent ones almost all violent crimes are committed by men and so you can see here that's a big reason why it disproportionately affects men considering that inequality relative poverty is the cause behind violent crime you are definitely going to see a disproportionate rise in men being incarcerated versus women because the inequality spiking is causing a spike in violent crime which means that men are going to be incarcerated for it more and more and finally these last couple of charts that were put together by the economist show the actual gini coefficient plotted across different countries for various measures of crime and violence and you can see here there is a direct correlation the more inequality the more violence okay so i'm pretty sure that i've laid out a fairly strong argument to show that violence violent crime is caused by relative poverty inequality and inequality itself has drastically increased since 1971, which shows that as soon as inflation started to skyrocket, violent crime started to skyrocket. Violent crime is caused by relative poverty. Relative poverty is caused by inflation. Now that I've laid out that argument, I do want to take a step back and provide a little bit of a devil's advocate argument here. Inequality is basically a law of nature. There's no way around it. The Pareto distribution basically governs most parts of nature, especially any parts of nature that have any sort of productive or creative output. When you look at population sizes, about 10% of the cities hold 90% of the population. There's vast inequality in the distribution of population across cities. When you look at galaxies and matter, a small percentage of galaxies hold most of the matter in the universe. When you look at musical output, a very small minority of musicians have all of the most popular songs out there. And that's with on all music or when you get into small domains like classical music, there's like five classical composers who have made all of the classical music that anybody knows of. It happens in sports as well, right? This is obviously very common knowledge. You have a couple athletes, a couple very, very elite athletes that have basically all of the money that goes to professional athletes as a whole. And so a curve, a Pareto distribution, a power curve governs most of nature. And so inequality in and of itself is not something that is is not something that is due purely to policy or government or culture. It's something that's built into the fabric of nature. And regardless of policies that have been tried, there have never been any governments or any policies or any actions that have been successful at flattening the curve. And anytime something like socialism, where you try and flatten or redistribute the wealth, it, all it does is transfer that small concentration of wealth into different hands. It, it transfers the ownership of that small portion of wealth, of that small concentration of wealth from the hands of the business owners and the producers and the entrepreneurs and to the bureaucrats and the politicians. The inequality is still there. It's just in different hands. And so the goal here in understanding what causes these things is not to eradicate inequality because you can't. It's just not possible. The problem of inequality is 
fundamentally deeper than any policy or any culture or any social agenda. That's why Jesus said the poor will always be among you. However, there are things that we do or cannot do that make the problem worse or better. And one of the biggest things that can be done is eliminating absorbing barriers. Now, what is an absorbing barrier? This is something Nassim Taleb talks about a lot, and I'll link this his article on it below. It's an excerpt from one of his books, Skin in the Game. And an absorbing barrier is basically, if you kind of get rich enough, you can potentially pass a point where there is no risk to you losing your wealth anymore. And this is becoming more and more true in America today. And it hasn't always been this way, but the more we move this direction, the more bailouts we have, that's socialism. That's not capitalism. Capitalism, there's risk for everyone. When you have bailouts and when you have government stepping in to prevent bankruptcies, bankruptcy is a risk to the rich. It transfers ownership of wealth from the incompetent hands to the more competent hands. And so having absorbing barriers is a discouragement to wealth creation. It's a discouragement to competition. It creates a steeper social ladder and it doesn't allow any for agility past a certain point, meaning that wealth starts to accumulate more and more rapidly in the hands of a few. When you allow fragility at the local level and in individual hands, you allow things to actually, allow bad things to actually happen, then the entire system overall gets more secure and it flattens the curve because it allows new entries, new people to enter markets, new competition to happen, and it allows the old guard to still fail when they stop performing the correct duties. And obviously, Obviously, the biggest and most important thing that we can do to start to reverse the trends towards inequality is to end the Federal Reserve and end a government monopoly on monetary policy on money, and that will start to reverse some of these trends. Money makes up 50% of every transaction. It's either on the buy side or the sell side of every single transaction. This means that the government, who has a monopoly on money, controls 50% of every Every transaction. We need to get the government out of our money. And the only way to do that successfully is going to be to use alternative forms of money. Put your wealth in gold, put your wealth in silver, put your wealth in Bitcoin, and start using your wealth and your purchasing power to vote for new powers. Vote for the free market to choose what money is instead of, instead of somebody who has demonstrated for decades that their policies are to transfer wealth from the entire pie via inflation and give that unlimited spending power to the government who directs that wealth into the hands of a chosen select few. Without this unlimited spending power, there wouldn't be the ability to bail out states who spend too much money on corrupt unions and corrupt government programs that are making the problems of inequality even worse. And the Fed, vote with your purchasing power and put your wealth into free market money, things that are not controlled by the government and start to end these monopolies and we'll start to see a reverse of the trends that cause some of this inequality that are leading to a lot of the violence and widespread inequality that we see in our states today. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please hit that like and subscribe button and send it along to somebody you think needs to hear this message. Really appreciate you guys. Have a great day.